As a Christian Holocaust begun, you don't want to miss today's show. After serving 12 years as the Vice President of Communications at Liberty University, Johnny Moore became the marketing strategist for some of the world's highest profiled leaders, shaping the spectrums of business, politics, education, and media while upholding the values of his Christian faith. Johnny also works closely with political and church leaders of the Middle East, championing the cause of religious freedom. His book, Defying ISIS, unveils the threat that ISIS is to worldwide Christianity, not just to Christians in the Middle East. Please welcome my friend, Johnny Moore. Hey, Johnny, welcome, man. Hey, it is great to have you here. Good to be here. So we're going to be talking today about defying ISIS. A nice, happy topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's an important topic. And why did you call it defying ISIS? Some people think I, I, I called it that because I was, like, trying to provoke. Yeah. But it's not what I was doing. In fact, I, I, I have one verse in the front of the book, which is my own sort of message to ISIS. It's on the title page, and it, it's Romans sixteen twenty, which is, Soon the God of peace will crush Satan underneath your feet. And that's sort of my, my subtle message. But I, I named it Defying ISIS because what I saw among the Christians that ISIS was trying to kill and trying to commit genocide against and eliminate and, and start a Christian Holocaust, that, that word defying was the best word to describe their faith in the face of that persecution. And so the book Defying ISIS is about the defiance of the Christian community that despite all this hate and terror and torture, all these barbaric things that are happening, they still stay committed to their faith. It's defiance of all of their hate. Now, you've been over there, and the book really begins to bring out uh, what is happening there, because people don't realize what's happening there. They just think it's another problem in the Middle East, and we've got some issues. Uh, but if, you were to, if we were to encapsulate what is going on over there, what would you tell people about ISIS? Well, first of all, it's not just about ISIS, right? I mean. If ISIS, the Islamic State, is eliminated in Iraq and Syria, ISIS will have effectively innovated terrorism, disrupted terrorism, you know, in the way that the iPhone disrupted the whole cell phone industry or, or the way technology has these disruptions over a period mm -hmm. of time. And, and they can take iconic companies and put them out of business because of disruption. Well, that's what ISIS did with terrorism. They innovated terrorism in three ways, theologically, tactically, and technologically. And so now we have, we have a terrorist group, ISIS, and those inspired by them, like Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab and other terrorist groups in 30 different countries, that are so brutal, they've been excommunicated by Al-Qaeda. And they're so agile that they're able to inspire a single person to do what it took Osama bin Laden 15 or 20 years to think up, train people, get them in a country, teach them how to drive airplanes, all of this. You know, I ISIS has, has created and disrupted and innovated terrorism in a way that will haunt our world long past the Islamic State. And with regard to Christians, th they have started a holy war against Christians. It's actually not a holy war. The holy war is inter-Islamic. It's between Muslim factions, these more radical Muslims, that's a very small percentage, and then like, an infinitesimally small percentage, and the rest of the Muslim community, which is largely peace-loving. That's the real holy war. Nevertheless, ISIS has tried to start a holy war against Christians. We just won't reciprocate. So you're saying this, what's going on is they're fighting amongst themselves, and, but they really do want to provoke all the Muslim world to kind of rally around them and come against Christians? Exactly. So, so in Iraq and Syria, we have the most ancient Christian populations on planet Earth, right? I mean, this, this is the birthplace of Christianity. There are as many Christian holy sites in Syria as in Israel. Okay, there are churches, really? in, for sure, and there are churches in Iraq and Syria that have had continuous worship services for, for 15, 16, 1700 years until 2014, right, when ISIS moved across that land. So cities like Mosul that we hear about in the news, it's in your Bible. It's the city of Nineveh in your Bible. Jonah's tomb was in Mosul. It was a, a, a pilgrimage site for Christians, Muslims, and Jews for hundreds and hundreds of years, and Muslims and, and, and Jews, Jews for thousands of years. They went to Jonah's tomb in the city of Mosul. Now, for the first time in 1,500 years, there are no Christians left in Mosul, zero. And this was a, this was a Christian city for centuries. Wow. And by the way, not just Mosul, but that entire part of Iraq and Syria. You know, so now, in the ancient Christian heartland of Iraq and Syria, there were, just a few years ago, in Iraq, 1.5 million Christians. 
Now they're under 200,000, nearly all of them displaced. In Syria, it was about 2 million Christians five years ago. Now it's under 400,000, nearly yeah. all displaced. And even in cities like Baghdad in Iraq that, are, that have some sense of a rule of law, you know, the Christians have had their property taken over, their businesses shut down, they've been discriminated against. So, so while ISIS is particularly evil within an Islamic context because they kill Muslims also, that's why they were excommunicated from Al-Qaeda, they will, if it's a, a Muslim, a Christian, or Yazidi, they will, the, Yazidi is an ancient, other, another ancient religion in, in Iraq, they will, they will kill the Yazidi and kill the Christian and then kill the Muslim. And their goal is to wipe the land of all infidels. In, in fact, Leon, every single piece of public communication made by the leaders of ISIS, either written or spoken, they always say they will march all the way to Rome and along the way they will break the crosses of the Christians and they will enslave their women and their children. And every time they have encountered a Christian community in Iraq and Syria, they've done just that. Just destroyed them all. They just destroyed the churches. Them. I, I have the price list of the slave market. What do you Mosul. mean a price list for a slave They market? have a modern day slave market in Mosul. When they took charge of Mosul, they created a slave industry. And the, the price list of the slave market lists the slaves by age and by religion, starting from one to nine years old, a Christian or Yazidi girl, just states it. One to nine years old, Christian or Yazidi, uh, I think it's 150 US dollars. And, and then it goes up. Who's up buying there? them? The, the soldiers, the ISIS soldiers. In fact, sometimes they're given them. In fact, there was one uh, competition in, in Mosul uh, and in El Raqqa in Syria. It was a Ramadan competition. So uh, a Bible, a, a Quranic memorization competition. And they awarded these young ISIS um, scholars for memorizing these verses. They awarded them with child slaves for memorizing these verses. Nine, ten-year-old little girls. Disgusting. Christians in these cities. One, one little girl showed up at a refugee camp. She escaped. I think she was 12 years old. She escaped in northern Iraq. She'd been raped by 20 men, and she was pregnant. I mean, this is what's happening. So, so wh while, while it isn't indicative of Islam, Mm -hmm. Right? So every, every member of ISIS calls themselves a Muslim, okay? Yep. But, but ISIS has killed more Muslims than anyone else, and, and, it, and we should not put all Muslims in this category. It's right. an infinitesimally small group. But this very, very small group has, has brought back a type of barbarism we haven't seen since the Dark Ages, and all the Western powers of the world have been asleep at the will. Now, I heard a retired American general say on national television that he expects the Muslim community to do something about this, all the moderates or, because uh, they, is anything happening that way? It, they're in a quandary, right? Because they thought they could control it. And so, so for, for years in, in, in Sunni countries, this, this extremism existed. And so they, they pacified it by by making donations to their charities, by, by turning a blind eye to certain things. They're, you know, they're famously a, a, a group of pages missing in the 9-11 Commission report in the United States that have to do with Saudi's involvement in 9-11. So, so they, they thought they could control it, but now... Who thought they could control the, it? The, the, the Sunni leaders in that part of the world. Okay. But now the Sunni terrorists have turned against them. And in order to, to have a foil against all of that, ISIS has created a Sunni Shiite holy war, right? And so, so now we, we have some, something that you know, the average Muslim scholar in, you know, in the Middle East would say, we, we didn't think of this as a religious war 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. It was just ethnic conflict between the Iranians and the Saudis, basically. But what ISIS has done is they've created a Sunni Shiite holy war like we haven't seen since centuries. And, and, and so now we have Saudi invading Shiites in Yemen, Iran through surrogates, in, in Yemen funding Shiite uh, terrorist groups that are attacking the Sunnis. We, we, we have uncorked the bottle in the Middle East and the most powerful countries in the world haven't a clue what to do about it. The question is whether there is even a solution or whether for the next series of generations we will see total chaos in the Middle East. 
Okay, let's take a break right here. And when we come back, I want to ask you the question, why in the world doesn't someone just go in there and just take these guys out? And uh, I want to talk about that. We'll be right back with Johnny Moore. And the truth is, we didn't know what was happening. Sure. We just chose not to do anything. And, and it's because our political leaders uh, have chosen to not do what's right. They've chosen to do what is popular. We believe Jesus Christ came to give every person on this planet a chance to live with power, passion, and purpose. Through award-winning, world-class TV programs like this and life-giving resources in Spanish, French, Italian, Russian, and Hindi, Spirit Contemporary is changing lives around the world. Considerable expenses are involved, but each person reached is absolutely worth the cost. People are saved, their faith revived, eternities transformed, all because of your support. With your donation today, you will receive today's special resource. What would you say if I asked you what's missing in life? Like how would your world change if you could access the miraculous but in a totally normal and natural way? That's the Spirit Contemporary Life. You are designed to go into that business world and be better than anybody out there. In fact, let me just prophesy God's original intent is that every believer be at the top of the heap. Get up and live so big the world gasps at what God can do through a person. Welcome back. My guest today is Johnny Moore, and we're talking about his book, Defying ISIS. Now, we are often when we watch the news, especially us, you know, the guys I know here in Canada, and I'm sure around the world, we're watching these little caravans of 40 vehicles, and they're going towards a city that we know they're going to kill every Christian there, and it totally behooves us as to why Obama or some country doesn't just go in there and just take them all out. Just boop, gone. Really, we don't have that capability, and why hasn't that happened? Of course we have the capability. We yeah. just choose not to use it. We choose not to. No, and I, I remember having this conversation with the Archbishop of Mosul, right? I mean, and this was one of the highest positions in the Christian church for centuries. This guy's exiled now. He has no home. He lost his church. He lost everything. It, 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 in fact, his church is the only church left in Mosul. They destroyed all the other ones, but they took his cathedral, and they, tur they, they turned it into a mosque, they broke the cross off the top of it, they painted the dome black, and they named it the Mosque of the Mujahideen, the mosque for the holy warriors, the suicide bombers. That's what they did to his church. And I remember talking to him in Jordan, uh, where, where we were having a meeting, and the Archbishop of Mosul said, what did you do? Speaking of America, he said, did you turn off the satellites? How, how did you not know this was happening? And the truth is, we didn't know it was happening. Sure. We just chose not to do anything. And, and it's because our political leaders uh, have chosen to not do what's right. They've chosen to do what is popular. 
That, 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 that's what they've done. And, and all the Western world was, in, was just exhausted with war in the Middle East. Lots of mistakes were made in wars in the Middle East. It caused cata catastrophe. Good was done. Bad was done. It was, all, it was all true. But the Western world didn't have the will to act. And because they didn't have the will to act, we allowed this to fester. So, so ISIS eventually, I mean, people don't realize this, but at its height, ISIS controlled one contiguous piece of land larger than the United Kingdom between Iraq and Syria, and they were making between one and five million dollars a day selling illicit oil th across the Middle East, largely through Turkey, you know, to other countries of the world, and, and the world just chose to turn a blind eye. And if that isn't awful enough, they were committing genocide when they were moving into towns. And, and if that wasn't awful enough, no one on planet Earth, in this country, in my country, in any country of anyone watching this, no one can say they didn't know what was happening. Right. Because ISIS was, was sending out press releases. Exactly. They were putting videos out on yep. Twitter. You know, it, it reminds me of that, that famous William, William Wilberforce quote. Well, you remember this quote where he says, <laughs> he says, you can never say you didn't know. Right? You can no longer say you didn't know. The only, only thing you can say is you chose not to act. And that's what our leaders did. They yeah. chose not to act. And because of that, more children were enslaved. More, more men were massacred, more widows were made. It just goes on and on and on. You know, I think it was Martin Luther King who said that there is no difference between those who do something atrocious and those who let it happen. And uh, it, it just, when a, when a leader doesn't use the power and the authority that they have for good, they immediately look weak and they lose the respect of every person that is under them or even is just looking at them. So the uh, United States just looks weak. That, that's true. And, they and, just look in, it's, incompetent. It's true. And from a Christian persecu persecution perspective, what ended up happening was that every bad actor in any other country of the world that has always wanted to get rid of their Christian population, now they feel emboldened to do it. Yeah. Because, because if the world didn't protect the Christians in Iraq and Syria in the birthplace of Christianity, then the world isn't going to protect them in Kenya, in no. Nigeria, in Libya, in Egypt. And so now in Egypt, we saw in the last few years more persecution against Christians in Egypt than in the previous 600 years combined. You know, yep. Boko Haram all over northern Nigeria has, in 2015, they committed 248 terrorist attacks or something, nearly all of them targeting Christian communities. So, so when the world doesn't act to protect the vulnerable, yep. then evil actors will be empowered to do more and, yep. and they'll kill more people and burn more churches and, and, and Wouldn't you say that Christians are the easiest people to persecute on the planet as far as all the different groups? It's, it's not my opinion, it's the, the opinion of, of major human rights organizations yep. across the world. Christians are, ne this is crazy. Christians are now the most persecuted group, religious group on planet Earth. Christians are. 75% of Christians living on planet Earth live in a country where they're severely persecuted. Yeah. Even the State Department's most conservative, the State Department, which, is, which doesn't like talking about Christian persecution in the United States, the State Department estimates that there are at least 60 countries in the world where Christians face severe persecution. And what do we do about it? We don't do anything about it. This is a rare yeah. conversation we're having here. Yeah, it is. And you know what? Christians have this pacifist kind of mentality. You know, I had this conversation, so I'm just going to say it on TV. But <laughs> where Jesus sent the 70 out and he said, don't take a coat, don't take any money, don't take a sword, things will be looked after. So everyone reads that and thinks, so Christians should never uh, protect themselves, should never try to, you know, bear arms. But then after Jesus died and rose again, he told them now, take a coat with you, take money with you and take a sword. And then Peter goes, well, here's two. Is that enough? And Jesus goes, that will be enough. <laughs> of course it was well, Peter, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. It was. So the I swords like weren't for picking their teeth. <laughs> no, no. They were being told, go protect yourself. You know, we're not walking around. So that's why I look at this situation and, and, and I just think to myself, yeah, there is a huge issue. And what we need to do is more programs like this where people just begin to get ticked off and go, what in the world? And start writing and phoning and there'll be an uproar and more TV about it so that people, because they're not even showing what's going on in, yeah, because in our, the Middle East now. If, if we have to show our political leaders that we will support them if they do the right thing, right? Yes. And, and what we do is we, we're not courageous, right? Nobody wants to talk about ISIS because they feel terror, they fear terrorism. Like no, no one, no one wants to, to say things that are politically incorrect. But by the way, in Canada, it, it's totally bizarre to me. And you guys are like the hockey country, okay, which is like the most violent sport on planet Earth. Yep. You know, and, and yeah, and yet you're like the nicest country on planet Earth. So maybe we got rid of hockey. You know, <laughs> <laughs> all that would yeah. be put in a different place. But but I, you know, in this case, in this case, even the Roman Catholic Church, which is a pacifist church, 
Mm -hmm. okay? Th their official theology is a theology of pacifism. Yep. But even Pope Francis, okay, who's not a warmonger, Pope Francis has said it is just war in this case. So our leaders, in the EU parliament, they've, they've declared genocide. They've said that ISIS is guilty of genocide against Christians, Yazidis, and other religious minorities. In the United States Congress, they've done that. In the United States State Department, they've done that. Like, I don't know what, else, what other protection we can give to these leaders. Our leaders just need to do what's right. That's why we elect them. Yep, that's very true. We've got to become very aware in our countries of the political process and how to move things, how to, whether you're writing letters, whether you're doing television shows, but the Christian world has power. We've got TV, we've got money, we can write letters, we can do, I mean, we can do a lot of different things. And I think we just need to kind of wake up. Yeah, it's kind of this slumbering giant called the church. How much do we have to start, you know, it has to happen before they wake up and say, okay, we're going to flex our muscles and do something. Yeah, and if we do, we're the most powerful group on planet Earth. Absolutely. And it, it doesn't mean we have to be, like, reckless no. about it. But I think, honestly, Leon, I, I think we have this mentality, like, you know, Jesus is going to come back any day, and so because he's going to come back any day, yeah. like, you know, well, it's not our problem, it's Jesus' problem. But, you know, Jesus gave us this earth to have stewardship over, right? Yep. It is our responsibility. And what an awful, awful thing for me to say to my three-year-old and my one-year-old, like, sorry, you know, figure it out, you know, and I'll be long gone, and they will have to face the consequences of the world That's that right. I left them, and yep. it's urgent. For 2,000 years, the Christian church has had a group that have said Jesus is coming back, and by that they mean that he's going to come and rescue us from this world of woe. And I understand what they're saying, but what it has done, especially in our generation, has created a excuse to do nothing. Because they're just, this is what most people will say when I talk to them, they'll say, well, this is what it says about the end times. We can't stop it. This is what it says. There's going to be wars. There's going to be, and they have this defeatist attitude. So the teaching of our own TV evangelists and those writing books have created an entire generation with this apocalyptic attitude. There's nothing we can do, so ride it out as safely as you can till Jesus rescues us. But that's not what the Bible teaches. No, it, it teaches occupy till I come. And the word occupy doesn't mean hide in a trench. It means get up and be salt and light, be leaders, be in politics, be everywhere. He says make uh, disciples of nations. He doesn't say just go get on the air. So we've got our work cut out for us. And the first thing we got is wake up the church and say, fine. I mean, if Jesus comes today, I'm not going to miss it because I'm out there occupying, winning souls, you know, building churches, you know, getting people trained for governments. Uh, but the church is just, we really have to wake up. We are the answer. We get upset because governments have to do stuff. But really the church has been commanded to go in there and, and to reach these people. No, it's what, it's what Jesus said. The gates of hell will not prevail yeah. against the church. But we, we tend to think of that as a defensive verse. You know, yeah. but, but if you read the language, it's not defensive. No. It's offensive. It's, yep. it's the church pursuing the gates of hell. The gates of hell are not strong enough no. to, ho to hold back the church. It's not the church gating itself up That's exactly you know, so that we can, we can be victorious. Yeah. And, and the truth is, I mean, Leah, we've we got to be honest. Like, there are a lot of prophets and preachers out there that are yeah. very prophetic in their language and very powerful when they preach their sermons. And they have zero courage yeah. because they're scapegoating the, the return of Jesus Christ. But the do world they make money on these end time books and stuff? And it's the, the church has got these itchy ears. Just tell me more about the end times. Why don't I tell you about the end times? The Bible says, go into the world. The harvest is white. Pray for laborers. You know, go ahead and reach countries for Jesus Christ. Lay your hands on the sick. Go in there. Like it is so obvious, but we've retreated behind these doctrines. And uh, I don't think I've, I've taught a message in our church uh, once in the last 10, 15 years, I probably did when I was younger, that just escapism, just, you know, wow, well, we're just going to get out of here, get out of here, get out of here, as much as I want, let's become the army. Let's become the family. Let's reach out. This and, is what uh, God has called us to do. Amen. And, and, and in this subject, I mean, these are our brothers and our sisters. They are. It's our family, and we're just letting them die every day. Yeah. Thank you for being with us today, Johnny. This has been awesome. Thanks for having me. My guest today was Johnny Moore. And I want to encourage you. There's so much more in this book. I want to encourage you to get a copy, Defying ISIS. We'll be right back. Devoted, a daily devotional created with you in mind. Easy to read and simple to understand. These two-minute faith boosters are available in eight different languages. Watch it on YouTube or have the booklet sent directly to your home. You can also receive Devoted to your email inbox daily. Become inspired as Leon Fontaine shares practical biblical teaching. Devoted is literally at your fingertips. 
Transform your life with this Spirit Contemporary devotional. Sign up to receive Devoted Today. Wasn't that an incredible interview with Johnny Moore? I think as believers, we need to wake up and begin to pray, begin to believe God that we can make a difference. We have to recognize that we are the powerful church of Jesus Christ. And I want to challenge you to do something about the situation. Don't be silent. I want to talk to you about what it means to be spirit contemporary. You know, as we teach and share, I want you to know that a lot of the ministry that we're doing is going into two languages that reaches a lot of the troubled area that we're talking about. We're going into Urdu and we're going into Persian. And it's your money, it's your giving that makes the difference. And so I want to encourage you today, you know, for a gift of $30 or more, and we're going to send you a great resource to help pick you up in your life to go into great places, but your giving helps establish people's names in the book of life. Your giving helps us literally to make an impact on entire areas that Johnny is talking about. They need to have the gospel blanketing that area in their language. And if you think they're not watching television, if you think they're not tuned into the world, you're mistaken. So what a great opportunity for you to also bring the powerful gospel of Jesus into this hurting region of the Middle East and all those countries. So go to your phone today. Become a partner. Your giving is going to change someone's life. We trust that you are being blessed, uplifted, and encouraged in your Christian walk through today's program. As a viewer, you should know that we care about you. We value you greatly and appreciate your prayers. Did you know that Miracle Channel is taking the good news of Jesus Christ around the world through award-winning programs like this? We are actively translating ministry programs into languages like Spanish, French, Italian, and even Russian. We even air on television stations in the Middle East. This means that millions upon millions of people are hearing about Jesus Christ in their language, and it's all thanks to people like you. Considerable expenses are involved, so we need your support because each person who gives their life to Jesus is absolutely worth the cost. Each is of infinite value to God. You are very important to us. We care greatly about your spiritual growth, which is why we would like to get today's resources into your hands. When you support this program by making a donation, you are not only enriching your walk with the Lord, you are sharing Jesus with someone on the other side of the globe your donation transforms lives by reaching literally millions of people with the gospel. Call now and change someone's life today. Tomorrow on The Leon Show, Dr. Doug Weiss joins Leon to share what it means to have a servant marriage. You don't become a servant instantly. No. I mean, you're a leader. It takes a while for people to, to grow in a church and become a servant and become a leader. Okay? The same with Adam. And see, Adam was not ready for marriage until he was a servant.